Chapter 13, The Story of Trinidad. When Columbus made his third voyage across the Atlantic in 1498, he sailed farther south. The heat became so great that the tar with which the seams of the vessels were made watertight melted. Columbus and his men fell ill, so he turned northward and made a vow that the first new land which he sighted should be named in honor of the Holy Trinity. At last, three peaks of an island were seen. He believed this to be an answer to his vow and named the island Trinidad, as it is still called today. The three peaks were the three sisters. From Trinidad, Columbus saw the mainland, but believed it to be another island, which he named Isla Sanca, or Holy Isle. Indians, lighter in color than any the Spaniards had seen yet, came out in canoe canoes to gaze at the strange vessels, but they could not be induced to come on board. Columbus nearly suffered shipwreck in the narrow strait between Trinidad and the mainland. On account of the roaring current that races through it, Columbus named the strait the Dragon's Mouths. Trinidad, the land of the hummingbird, is the most southerly of the West Indian islands. It is only a few miles from the coast of South America, of which in bygone days, it probably formed a part for the native birds, animals, and plants are the same as those on the mainland. In 1595, nearly a hundred years after Columbus's visit, a famous Englishman, Sir Walter Raleigh, visited the island. As he was being rowed ashore from his ship, he noticed many little brooks of fresh water and one salt river that had stores of oysters on the branches of the trees and were very well tasted. Oysters can still be seen growing on the roots of the mangrove trees in Trinidad. Raleigh also visited the great black lake of bubbling asphalt. At this point called Tierra de Brie or Peach, he wrote, there is such abundance of stone pitch or bitumen that all the ships of the world may be loaded from thence. He added that they made trial of it for caulking their ships and found it was most excellent good and melted not with the sun as the pitch of Norway and therefore is most useful for ships sailing to the south. Raleigh visited Trinidad a second time in 1617 on his way to Guyana and again rode up the pitch lake describing the pitch rising out of the ground in little springs and fountains, and so running a little way it hardeneth in the air and covereth all the plain. The natives who once lived on this part of the island told a story about the origin of the pitch lake. Some of the Chamia tribe once built their palm leaf huts on the spot where the lake now lies. They celebrated a victory over another tribe by killing vast numbers of hummingbirds, which they ate after decking themselves with the lovely shining plumage of the little birds. They did this forgetting that hummingbirds were supposed to be spirits of their ancestors. The great spirit was so angry at this wanton destruction that as a punishment, he caused the earth to open and a great black tide of pitch rose to the surface, engulfing the village and its people. Although the Spaniards took possession of Trinidad in the early 16th century, the colony did not attract sufficient settlers. And in 1783, the Spanish government invited foreigners to settle there. As a result of this invitation, French and Irish colonists from other islands came to Trinidad. English colonists were fewer as the terms of settlement favored only Roman Catholics. A few years later, in 1789, the Great Revolution broke out in France, and the French king and queen and many nobles were cast into prisons and afterwards put to death. Then, many French royalists flocked into Trinidad. But the new French Republic also sent some of their supporters to the island, and it was clear that they were waiting for a chance to seize the island for Republican France.
The planters and others in the British West Indian Islands were full of complaints about the rulers of Trinidad. A further grant of land was made to Trinidad settlers for every additional slave they brought to the island. This led to much slave stealing from the British colonies, and even free Negroes were sometimes carried off. Thus, Trinidad was looked upon as a source of mischief to the British islands, being a shelter for privateers who annoy our trade and carry off slaves and property. In 1796, during the Napoleonic War in Europe, Spain declared war on Britain. In the next year, a British force was sent to attack Trinidad. Ten armed ships and three transports carrying nearly 8,000 troops under Sir Ra Ralph Abercrombie sailed from Martinique and arrived at sunset off Port of Spain, the chief town of Trinidad. They found four Spanish battleships and a frigate lying under the batteries. The Spanish vessels had put into Port of Spain on their way to Cartagena and remained at the request of the governor. At two o'clock the next morning, the lookouts on the British ships reported that the Spanish vessels were burning. It was true. The Spanish admiral, fearing he could not defend himself if attacked, had fired his ships rather than let them be taken by the British. Only one was captured. The next day, the island surrendered without firing a single shot, one of the easiest and most profitable captures that ever fell to the British in the Caribbean. Trinidad was officially declared British in 1802 by the Treaty of the Amiens. The sleepy Spanish dependency soon became a thriving British colony. Port of Spain is now the second largest city in the British West Indies. It is beautifully situated and has a fine Roman Catholic cathedral. A few miles from the city are the Imperial College of Tropical Agriculture and the central station of the Empire Cotton Growing Corporation, which are attended by students from all parts of the world. A traveler of today, if he stands with his back to the factory buildings, can see the Great Pitch Lake almost as Raleigh saw it more than 300 years ago. The surface has sunk no more than 20 feet in all those years, but as more and more pitch is removed, it is probably now sinking slightly more rapidly. The surface is solid enough to walk on and the pits dug soon disappear. This is due to the pitch finding its own level as water does and not because the supply is inexhaustible. The pitch is exported in two forms, raw asphalt and asphalt cement. The company carrying out the work pay the government 30,000 sterling a year for their rights. The only other pitch lake in the world is in Venezuela and is worked by the same company. Trinidad's main source of wealth is its oil, but it has other subsidiary industries such as cement, textiles, matches, glass, and coconut oil products, while improvements have been made in its agriculture. Tobago, Trinidad's small neighbor, has probably changed hands more often than any other West Indian island. Dutch and British both settled there in the years of colonization after 1625. After captures and recaptures, it was finally ceded to the British in 1814 by the Treaty of Paris and for 75 years was included in the Windward Group. In 1889, it was placed under the governor of Trinidad.